So uh, I'm a biostatistician. Like alcohol. You're bad biostatistician? No, alcohol. Oh, uh, bad biostatistician? No, I am a biostatistician. It means that I spend a lot of time trying to control the future by thorough planning. And I think we can do that. I mean, I actually think you can do it with clinical trials. Uh, it's been my experience, at least, that randomization works. <laughs> that is, when you look at baseline, the groups don't look any different from each other. That part I know works. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> uh, but the rest of it is really, it is a, it, it's, it's tough to try to control what you're going to see in a clinical trial, and that's why uh, you see as I go through this, some of the issues that I think are important in, uh, and moving forward with the possibility of doing adaptive trials as opposed to the traditional non-adaptive trials. So here's a quote I think is a good introduction to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So this is from uh, Yogi Berra. Uh, who, uh, I added the name Rashi because he, it really is more, you know, his name Yogi came from a Indian philosophy. He used to have his legs crossed on the bench waiting. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but this is more Zen than it is uh, Indian philosophy. I think it's, I think it's a great. I think what, <clears throat> why I use it as an introductory comment is that, um, you know, biostatisticians for the past 20 years have been developing theory about adaptive trials. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of literature out there on how to practice, how to put that into practice, but it hasn't been adopted. Uh, it's not used very often, and it's, a lot of it has to do with the complexity and, let's say, the transparency of doing uh, adaptive trials as opposed to the simple ones that we're used to. So I'm calling the ones that we're used to non-adaptive trials. Um, you know, they have these components. I mean, we've been using these now in medicine for about 60 years. I remember there was an article in the British Medical Journal in 2000 that said the most important development in the last 50 years in medical research was the randomized control trial. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think, you know, it raises the question of if it's been so successful in the past, why are we changing it or why are we thinking about uh, doing things differently? So here's the non-adaptive or traditional randomized control trial. It has fixed randomization that is right at the design stage. You know who's getting what in a sense that is whoever shows up next, you know what the random assignment is. Uh, in uh, an adaptive design, that may not be true. You could possibly use adaptive randomization. Or in an adaptive design, you could drop some arms or you could drop doses. In which case, the randomization has to start when you change the design. Uh, <clears throat> again, um, uh, we all know that at the design stage, it's really important to have a number that provides you with sufficient power, and that's fixed at the design stage. But in adaptive trials, you may be able to update that, increase it typically. Um, and of course, we, you know, this, we think of the double-blind trial as the gold standard. Uh, whereas in an adaptive trial, we may be able to look halfway through the trial, break the blind, and get an effect size out. Um, you know, also, we have, uh, we always specify ahead of time what the plan will be for analysis, what the hypothesis test will be. But in adaptive trials, you might be able to change the primary endpoint. Well, that's fairly controversial. It's, it's a possibility, especially if you have multiple endpoints. Uh, that go into a composite. You may decide, oh, I'm going to drop that one from the composite if at an interim analysis. Very complex. Intention to treat analysis, uh, you know, is something that we always talk about. That's not going to change, I don't think, for the adaptive trials. But one possibility is that as you go through with the complexity of trying to control type 1 error, as you go through a trial, different subjects may end up with different weights in terms of their contribution to the test statistics. It means that it's not exactly following this principle. Not every, each person doesn't have an equal weight in going into the uh, analysis. So that's a general comment on, you know, where they might differ. 
this is probably the simplest example of an adaptive trial. Uh, that is, it's a group sequential trial design, a GST, I'll call it. And there are two possible adaptations under this. One is you could stop early because you find with a very conservative significance test that you already have proven efficacy. And so you could stop the trial halfway through, not recruit any other patients because you've rejected the null hypothesis already. Uh, <clears throat> another possibility is you could stop because of utility. That is, because of a conservative significance test, you find it so unlikely that you get significance at the final analysis that you just stop the trial halfway through. So those are two possible adaptations. Stopping because you have enough evidence already, and stopping because uh, it's futile to go on. You won't get a significant result. Um, and so, again, I'm trying to oversimplify, uh, but this is a GST example. Uh, let's say we have a two-group uh, study. The assumed effect size is 0.5 standard deviation. We plan to do a one-sided test at 0.025. We want power to be 90%. There's one check for either efficacy or futility, say, halfway through the study. And uh, with these conditions, we end up saying we need 86 patients per group. Uh, so at the interim, we may look at the results for 43 patients per group. And at that point, if we do an efficacy test, we would need a p-value less than 0 0.002. You can see that's pretty conservative. It means the z-test would have to be 3, which means that the effect estimate, the treatment effect estimate, is three times bigger than the standard error, uh, which is a pretty big effect. And if we got something like that, P less than 0, 0, 002, we could stop the trial early and claim efficacy. Uh, the nice thing about <clears throat> this conservative uh, p-value, stopping early conservative p-value, is that it doesn't really change the requirements for getting significance at the end of the trial. With this, at the end of the trial, the final test requires P to be less than 0 0.025 approximately, that is a z-test of 1.97. If we never did a group sequential trial, just did a <clears throat> straightforward final analysis trial, the z would have to be 1.96. So you really, it's no cost to look early, at least not in terms of, uh, of power. And, and then we could also stop for futility, uh, but we want to make sure we don't stop for futility uh, unless there's a really low probability that we'll get significant, uh, assuming you have a, the effect size that you expect is 0.5 standard deviation. You could stop for futility if the Z test halfway through is less than 0.27. That's the P value of about 0.4. But what it really is saying is, if I had a Z test of less than 0.27, the P value is less than 0 0.022 if the effect size was actually 0.5 standard deviation. And so with that small p-value, I can reject the proposed effect size of a half a standard deviation and say that, you know, I'm stopping and claiming futility. That's a simple example. The GST is not fully adaptive. <clears throat> Why? Because the final stage sample size is fixed ahead of time. It's not going to change. You, get, you can't get, to, you don't get the increase type of design. Um, there's no possible change in the planned hypothesis testing. And the decision to stop early uh, is not deliberative. That is, you set up the, the rule ahead of time, and if you've got like the P less than 0 .002, uh, you know, as a significant indicator of utility, you would stop. You wouldn't look any closer at the data to say, well, is it worthwhile moving on because there are other things we can get out of this product? <clears throat> so because of these restrictions on adaptation, um, the FDA uh, has written a, a guidance on adaptive trials. It came out in February 2010. And they like group sequential trials that don't have all the, all the possible adaptations I mentioned just these two of stopping for efficacy or futility with a fixed sample size. Um, we know from inside information that it took them two years to put this report together 
class statisticians were meeting every couple of weeks, trying to you know look at all the literature, decide what they were going to uh, say to the pharmaceutical industry, because of course that's their main concern. You know, there's some way that the pharmaceutical industry can use adaptive trials to their advantage, and all of the rest of us will get lost in the complexity of the trial. Um, you know, a drug would be approved for no good reason. Um, they are not, FDA is not ready, therefore, to uh, uh, adopt adaptive trials uh, in general. Um, <clears throat> uh, so what's wrong with repeated testing? I think everybody here knows you can't just keep testing the same hypothesis over and over again as you accumulate data and expect that you told type 1 error. But there is an interesting thing about even the GST, and that is that as opposed to the double-blind requirement that we used to use for uh, randomized trials, now you're looking at the data ahead of time, halfway through, say. And that could have some influences on how you proceed. Maybe subtle influences, not obvious ones. Maybe you change you know, things in such a way that, uh, uh, that you improve your chances of getting significance. So that's the main, I think, one of the main concerns even with this conservative GST. What does unblinding do? Um, so now I'm going to go to move away from the group sequential trials to some other approaches that are more fully adapted. Uh, and the ones I'm mostly interested in, that Becky mentioned, is the re-estimation of sample size. Um, and in these, you don't decide ahead of time what the sample size will be. You still come up with some estimate, but you are allowed to go in in the middle, anywhere you want to look, and decide that you may have an insufficient sample size, so you need to increase it. Um, <clears throat> the FDA guidance actually approves of this approach, of changing or increasing the sample size, as long as the analysis at interim remains blinded. So here's one uh, that we worked on, we published in 2010, um, and we developed a method of blinded re-estimation in a time-to-event uh, trial with the recurrence of uh, breast cancer in premenopausal women. Um, we originally had a sample size of 170 per group. One year before the approval ended, uh, the blinded failure rate was lower by 35% than expected. So this was concerned. We, the sample size was based on a certain expectation of the number of failures we have by the end of the trial, and we were lo lower by 35%. Um, so in order to accommodate that, uh, it required a 56% increase in the final sample size to maintain the power of 80%. Um, that actually worked out okay. Uh, we developed this method generally, uh, which retained blinding and allowed an increase in N, only an increase, not a decrease. And uh, we showed that it produced an unbiased test result so that didn't have to be adjusted in any way. Um, and we, we actually got, so this was important to us, extra funding in order to get those extra 90 <laughs> patients that we need. Uh, we, were, we convinced the review panel that it was worthwhile to extend the trial and add, uh, add patients to the pool. So in the more adaptive trials, uh, the concept of conditional power is really important. It it's like lays the foundation of choosing, say, an increase in sample size or uh, adapting the trial in other ways. It's defined as the probability of achieving significance Given the observations that you have at an interim analysis, now this could be blinded, like the example I just gave, or it could provide you with an effect estimate early on. Halfway through, you actually get a treatment effect estimate, and uh, so that could influence uh, a calculation uh, for conditional power. Um, it depends, of course, on the sample size for the next stage, that is, how much more information you're going to collect into the next stage. And it depends on some estimate or assumed value for the effect size. Um, it, this conditional power theory is something that we're looking into in terms of how you report it, 
to a, say a DSFC? How do you report it to investigators? Like what? What are the ways you can use it? Uh, especially since it's a statistic. It's not something that's fixed. It depends on a bunch of parameters that have sampling distribution. So conditional power has its own sampling distribution. So we're trying to figure out ways to report on it. Um, so um, one of the possibilities is when you want to possibly increase the sample size of the second stage, what do you use at the interim analysis to decide on what that should be? One possibility is to use an estimate of the effect size that you saw at that point in time. That is, you break the blind, get an effect size estimate, and uh, then calculate conditional power based on that uh, and other parameters. And this is what I just said before. I think the sampling distribution of conditional power is very critical. You know, you as opposed to going through a trial with a smaller sample size and going halfway through, you can only see 40 patients, as opposed to a trial where you know you have information on 200 patients halfway through, quite a different conditional distribution uh, that you're dealing with. So um, I'll get into conditional power in an example uh, that we're using in a second. But here are some other adaptations that seem kind of controversial, but, but interesting. These are being discussed. You could drop arms in a halfway through. So drop arms or doses. You just you start out with, say, an exploratory attitude. And then the second half of the study, you just continue on. And patients that are in the uh, arms that you keep, but uh, the arms that you don't want to continue uh, you know, randomizing to, they get dropped. And uh, and then you combine the data from that first exploratory stage with uh, the con more, uh, let's say, confirmatory stage using a subset of the arms of the um, That's one possibility. Uh, you can switch from superiority to non-inferiority. Actually, you don't need any adaptive trial theory to do this. this is, you can start out with the idea that you want to do a superiority study, but actually, uh, especially with active controls, decide that non-inferiority is good enough. Uh, however, you have to specify that margin of non-inferiority ahead of time. You can't specify it after you look at the interim analysis and say, oh, it's 20% inferior, maybe we need to pump it up down to 20% non-inferior, so 15%, wherever you started with. Um, <clears throat> you could start with uh, uh, the idea that you want to look at some biomarkers to determine who benefits the most or least from them. So halfway through, you can say, I think we're going to change the target population. Uh, there's a discussion about seamless phase two, three designs, going from you know this uh, decision uh, trial or phase two where you're trying to just show some promise of efficacy, using those patients again and combining with uh, phase three patients, a confirmatory type uh, combination with an exploratory trial, and adaptive randomization, which uh, people don't seem to like, but it's, you know, if you know what that is in terms of the old ideas of play the winner rule, you could say, well, uh, if I can get responses fairly quickly from patients, then I may randomize them based on the probability that they'll respond. Uh, so one treatment may start to increase in likelihood to be the one that's assigned if people respond better to that treatment. It causes all sorts of statistical problems that people don't really want to deal with. So with all these adaptive options, the question is, can you still claim that the trial is control, the way we think about the standard confirmatory randomized controlled trial. Uh, now, if we have adaptive trials, can you say that they're sufficiently controlled to be as conclusive as the fixed non-adaptive trial? Um, you know, biostatisticians have been looking at this, and what they essentially say is that the only way to really do this is to map out all the possible decisions fairly complex, and then trying to take that into account, make sure that once you know what those decisions might be, 
you can still control type 1 and type 2 error adequately. Um, <clears throat> so here's something that we've been working on for about 18 months. We do a lot of animal experiments in, uh, designed in the Center for Biostatistics. And so uh, we've got some simple procedures uh, on doing adaptive animal experiments. And uh, in this case, <clears throat> when we looked, we found almost nothing published on adaptive design of small sample size experiments. The only ones that we saw were using an internal pilot study and combining that data with the final uh, experiment. But we came at it from a different perspective, trying to address this question that we get uh, often enough, which is, you know, my p-value is not quite significant. How many more mice do I need to achieve significance? Uh, surprisingly, there's no answer to that, or there hasn't been an answer to that question. Not an unbiased answer, anyway. Uh, you can't just add more animals, throw it together with the with the data you had in the first experiment, and, and now say I control type one error. So, <clears throat> um, so this is sort of how we do it in, in a simplified form. Uh, we now design our experiments and actually write in R1s or PPGs, this is how we do sample size for animals. What we say is that the experiments can have two stages. We start out with the first stage where we expect to get significance. That is, it's not a halfway look. It's the point at which we don't, we don't want to run this experiment again. It's the point at which we expect to get significance. But we allow for adding more animals in order to uh, get significance when it's not achieved in that first stage. So from the first uh, stage of the experiment, and it's the one we usually run, um, we get a p-value, we call it p1. If p1 is less than some value alpha 1, which might be very close to, say, 0.05, it might be 0.04. So if p1 is less than 0.04, say, we stop and declare significance. If P1 is greater than this other value, say alpha zero, we stop and declare futility. How you set alpha zero uh, determines, uh, you, know, you know, what kind of increase in sample size you're, living, you're willing to live with. It. So, uh, we found that there's a simple way to decide on alpha zero, uh, but it might be something like 0.1. So in that first experiment, if the p-value is 0.1 or 0.2, you might say, that's promising enough, and I'm going to spend the resources to do this experiment again with additional animals. Uh, so if it's greater than 0.1, you stop and declare futility. But if the p-value from that first experiment is then between alpha 1 and alpha 0, you determine the, the size of the second experiment in order to uh, provide you with a, you know, adequate power to get significance when you combine the data from the first experiment and the data from the second experiment. Fairly simple. We tried to make it a fairly simple process. But, you know, this is a statistics lecture, so I want to give you an equation. You know, one equation. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I really, I wanted to show you that it's not, it's not just a simple uh, uh, calculation. Um, it involves uh, five parameters. So to calculate conditional power in this context of having a two-stage experiment involves, you know, uh, you know, remember it's a probability of getting significance finally when you're done with the experiment. It involves an effect size, yes, that's delta, the sample size for that second stage experiment, uh, um, a critical value for doing this test, which depends on, remember, the alpha one and the alpha zero, and then the p-value you got in that first stage experiment and the sample size in that first stage experiment. And finally, I'll just show you uh, how this method we uh, used actually ends up providing some fairly simple rules about how to choose alpha zero and alpha one, um, and uh, also in some simplifying results. You can see all these different colored lines are for different sample sizes that you start out in the first stage. N1 equals 4, 6, 8, 10. doesn't really matter. When you look at this plot down the x-axis here, those are possible values of alpha 0. Uh, 
is that's the value where you decide, I'm, you know, if the p-value is bigger than alpha zero, I'm not going to go on with the second state. I'm going to stop where I am and claim futility, not spend any more resources. So let's just pick an alpha zero. Say we picked alpha zero to be p equals 0.1. Um, and then you can see if the p-value was actually at 0.1, you just made that criteria, you would have to have uh, about five times as many animals in that second experiment as the first. And that value, five, the, you know, it's the ratio of n2 to n1, doesn't change. It's not dependent on uh, the actual uh, sample size in the first stage or the underlying effect size. It depends on uh, the p-value you got the first time. So, uh, at least in our method. Uh, so I just wanted to show you that at least in the animal experiments, we developed a method, we think, which we can convince review panels that we know what we're doing in running the animal experiment. We're not going to overuse animals, that is, we we'll use them as efficiently as possible, and, uh, and that you know we'll have sufficient power. Because one of the things that happens sometimes when we try to justify the sample sizes we choose in these experiments is viewers will come back and say, you don't have any preliminary data. How did you come up with that sample size? And often we can, we can do a good job of guessing on that sample size. But even when we guess on that sample size, even when we're right about the parameters we choose, we typically set power to 80%, but we still have a one in five chance of not getting significant to write about uh, the effect size. So this covers that and, and and so it's how we move forward. In any case, I, I pre presented this as an example because I think it's pretty transparent what we're doing. We're just getting two stages of data, putting them together, getting significant. Um, and the question, I think, as we move forward with adaptive trials in humans is, you know, how much is the audience going to be able to handle in terms of complexity and lack of transparency? I can tell you in looking at the literature, it would be really hard for a non-biostatistician to actually figure out what the decision process is about, about futility or efficacy or, you know, and so without a bunch of people coming together and saying, yes, I see how you came to that conclusion, I don't know that adaptive trials will be convincing enough except in exploratory phases rather than in confirmatory phases of drug development. So I'll just end with Yogi again. All right, thank you.